Hello and welcome to the third lecture of type systems. In this lecture we're going to talk about the consistency and termination of the simply typed lambda calculus. So in the last lecture we saw how evaluation in the simply typed lambda calculus corresponded to proof normalization in propositional logic. And so what we had was an act of knowledge transfer from computation to logic. So we noticed the Cur Curry-Howard correspondence between propositional logic and the simply typed lambda calculus, and we saw that there was a strong collection of analogies between types and propositions, between terms and proofs, and so on for each of the logical connectives, and in fact each of the terms of the simply typed lambda calculus correspond to some rule of logic about how to deduce. And so we, th we made the leap that any property of the simply typed lambda calculus actually tells us something about logic. So we did some a transfer from computation to logic um, because normalize, uh, evaluating a proof makes less sense than evaluating a program. But then you can ask us the converse question. You can say, well, we went from computation to logic, but is there any way that we can go in the other direction? Is there any property of logic that doesn't make intuitive sense in computation, but can shed light on computation once we transfer it. And so, if you think about it, an important property of any logic is the property of consistency, that there are no proofs of false. Because if you had a proof of false, well, remember the principle of explosion, or ex falso quad libit, will, will tell us that if you get a proof of false, then the bottom elimination rule will let you prove anything at all. And a logic where literally everything is provable is actually useless. But we basically never think about consistency in the context of a programming language. What could that even mean? So let's take a look at it. So remember what the simply typed lambda calculus looked like. We had a collection of types, unit, products, the empty type, disjoint union, and functions, and a collection of values, the, the unit value, pairs of values, lambda abstractions for, or function values, and left and right injections into the sum type. And one thing you'll notice when you're looking at that list of values is we have a value for every type. So for unit, we have units. For pairs, we have, for the product type, we have pairs. For the sum type, we have left and right injections. For function types, uh, implication, we have lambda abstractions. But we don't have anything at all for the empty type. So we have no values of type 0, which means we have no normal forms of type 0. So, so okay, that's supposed to be the empty type. It shouldn't have any values. Um, and so we might wonder, but what about non-values? Are there any terms of type 0 that aren't part of, that, that can be written in this calculus? And you know, you can say, okay, well, what have we proved about the simply typed lambda calculus? Um, well, what we've proved so far is type safety. So we proved progress, which says that if E is well typed and closed, then E is either a value or it takes a step. And we also proved type preservation, which says that E is a closed term and it takes a step, then the it t thing it took a step to is also well typed. And so, if we did have a closed term of type 0, then what progress is telling us is that it always has to take a step. So we know the progress tells us it's either a value or it steps, and we know there, there are no values of type 0, so that means it has to take a step. But the term it would t uh, step to, so if E has type 0 and it steps to E prime, then we know that that term E prime it stepped to would also have the type 0, because type preservation tells us that the type does not change when you evaluate a term. A well-typed term stays well-typed and it stays the same type. And so what this means is that if you have a closed term of type 0, it steps to another closed type of term 0, 
which also has to step to another ter closed term of type 0, and so on, and so on, and so on. So any closed term of type 0 must loop. It must evaluate forever. It, it runs forever. It never halts. Oh, well, now you think, okay, that's an interesting observation. So logically, we know there are no proofs of false. And here we've just proved that if we had a lambda term of type 0, it must loop forever. So maybe there's some connection between evaluation and halting. So we could show that the simply typed lambda calculus did not have any uh, proofs of false, any terms of type 0, if we could prove that every simply typed term reached a value. Then you would know, okay, if we had a closed term of type 0, then we would know it would evaluate to value, but there aren't any values of type 0, so therefore there can't be any. Then so, so we might say, okay, well, let's try to prove that. So let's try to prove that if E has the type X, then there will be a value V such that E eventually reaches V. So that star notation means E steps to V in zero or more steps. It's the transitive closure of the steps to relation. And so the obvious thing to try, this won't work, but it's the, it's the obvious thing to try and it'll teach you something when it doesn't work, is to try to do induction on the derivation of E. And so Let's pick one of those cases. Let's pick the function application case. This is actually the case that breaks. And so if we if e is a function, e a uh, function application, then it's going to be a function expression and an argument expression. So e let's call it e e prime has the type y and that means that e must be a term of type x arrow y and e prime must be a, tri a term of type x. And so we would know that if every closed term eventually reaches a value, then by induction we know that E has to reach a value. And by induction on the argument, we know that E prime has to become some other value, V prime. Okay, well, that's good. And now, since we know the, uh, that type preservation tells us that evaluation doesn't change the type of a term, we know that if E, a well-typed term of type X arrow Y, evaluates to V, we know that V has to have the type X arrow Y. It has to be a value of function type. And similarly, we know that V prime has to have the type X. So um, E prime had the type X and E prime evaluated to V prime, so therefore, it has to have, V prime has to have the type X as well. Okay, so we have a value V of type X arrow Y. What else do we know? Well, we know that the only value of function type is a lambda expression. So we know that V has to equal lambda X dot E double prime for, uh, for some E double prime. We don't know what that is, but we know it's got to be a function. And because it's a function, lambda expression at a function type, we know that E double prime has to have the type Y with a free variable X. And now, well, we have on line 7, we have V prime that has the type X. And on line 9, we have E double prime with a, with a whole of type X. And so we can fill them in with substitution. And so we'll say, okay, well, we know that V prime for X and E double prime has the type Y, and we want to show that this thing also evaluates to a value. And we can't. The reason is that this thing right here is not a subderivation of the application. E double prime is not a, a, a subterm of E applied to E prime. It just isn't. And so we can't do induction. So the proof gets stuck at this point. And so to figure out how to fix this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to cut down the lambda calculus a little bit, just enough to actually get us off the ground. So we're going to throw out products and we're going to throw out sums and all we're going to be left with is units, functions, and the empty type zero. So 
You can't actually compute anything very interesting in this calculus, but you can prove something interesting about it. You can prove that every term in this calculus terminates. And so that's just what we're going to do. So what is it? So we still have variables, and we still have units, we have lambda expressions and applications, and we have the elimination rule for the empty type. So um, abort E is the is the this is dead code I can I can just die here command and so the type of a variable little x has the type big X when it's in the context gamma the unit value always has the unit type a lambda expression has the type x arrow y when you put the variable into the context at type x and you check that the body has the type y and a function application it says that E applied to E prime has the type Y when E is a f the function expression of type X arrow Y and E prime is the argument of type X. And finally, if we ever do somehow cook up a value of type zero, we can um, we can X falso it. We can explode and say, well, abort E will have any type. Okay. And we still have a operational semantics for this language. So abort has a congruence rule. If E steps to E prime, then abort E will step to abort E prime. And for function reduction, for application reduction, we'll say, okay, if you have an application E1, E2, then we'll do left to right evaluation. So we have a congruence rule that says if E1 steps to E1 prime, then E1, 2 will step to is e1 e2 will step to e1 prime applied to e2 or e and conversely and and when the function position is a value we evaluate the argument so if e2 goes to e2 prime then v1 e2 will go to v1 e2 prime and then when we actually have a la uh, a lambda abstraction and a very a value applied to it we evaluate that by substitution and so this is actually why we cut down the rules. These, this is the entire set of reductions. And one thing we can prove about this reduction relation is that it's deterministic. So we fixed an evaluation order. It's left to right evaluation. And so this means that if E steps to E prime and E steps to E double prime, then we know that E prime and E double prime have to be the same. There's only one way to evaluate any given term. And so you can prove this by structural induction on E steps to E prime. And so you'll say, uh, if you have E steps to E prime, you can do an induction on it, and then you'll deconstruct the E steps to E double prime at the same time. And then the proof will go through. It's, it's uh, similar in flavor to the proof of uh, type preservation, where you have a well typing and a reduction. And so you just pick one of them to, you just pick one of them to do induction on. Um, so here it doesn't matter which one you pick to do induction on, like the other one will just come along for the ride. Okay, so now let's come back to term the termination problem we had before. So we tried to prove termination by structural induction on a typing derivation, and we discovered we couldn't. And the problem was that when we had a term the, of function type, evaluating it to a function doesn't tell us that applying the function terminates. So let me pop back here. So here we knew that E steps to V and E prime steps to V prime, and we knew that V is actually a lambda abstraction. It's equal to lambda x dot E double prime. And so the next step of reduction is to actually do this substitution. And after you've done the substitution, you're stuck because you don't know anything at all about the body of that function. So somehow the thing we need to do is we need to make a stronger assumption, a stronger assumption that tells us that not just that a function expression evaluates to a value, but that when you apply it, that that function value will also terminate. So we need a sort of hereditary notion of termination. So let's define this. This, this, this kind of uh, uh, um, invariant is called a logical relation. They were, <coughs> they sort of 
first hit the consciousness of programming language researchers in the in the 1970s the late mike gordon who uh, who used to be a lecturer here until until just a few years ago he was one of the people who uh, who popularized this but it actually turns out that the that the person who invented logical relations was a, a person named Robin Gandhi, and his PhD was supervised right here in Cambridge by Alan Turing himself. And so if you go on the internet, you can find Robin Gandhi's thesis, and he will be proving things about, uh, about computations by defining logical relations. And so that's that's kind of a a neat connection to like some of the you know the uh, founding the founding ancestors of computer science here. So so let's look at the definition of a logical relation. And so first, let's say that an expression halts just when there's a value that it evaluates to. And so e halts when there exists a V such that E eventually reaches V. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to define a, not just a set of terms or a predicate on terms, but a whole family of them, one for every type in the programming language. And so we can say that the set halt zero is going to be the empty set. And we're going to define the set halt one to hold just whenever E halts. So and then we'll say that the set halt x arrow y are those expressions e such that e halts and for every e prime that's in alt halt x the application e e prime is in halt y and so what's going on here is we're trying to give this hereditary definition of halting so we're saying halt 1 halt unit is just the property of halting and halt one arrow one says I halt, and also if you give me any halting argument, the result will halt. So halt one arrow one says these are the terms that preserve the property of halting. And so you can lift this up. So halt one arrow one arrow one arrow one preserves the proper are are those higher order functions which preserve the property of preserving the property of halting and so on up the ladder to types as complicated as you'd like okay so this is a definition what can we say about it well what we can do is first we can prove a few a few properties about this logical relation and then we'll apply it to the problem of proving consistency or the or equivalently the problem of proving termination so what we're going to do first is we're going to show that the set halt sub x is closed under halt, uh, under evaluation so we're going to say that if e steps to e prime then e prime is in halt x if and only if e is in halt x so that means that any term in halt x um, is closed under evaluation. So if you have a term in the halting set and it takes a step, that, that, that new thing is also going to be in the halting set. And conversely, if you have something in the halting set, anything that steps to it is also going to be in that same halting set. And so the way we will prove this is not by any kind of induction on typing derivations or anything like that, but by induction on the types themselves. And so Let's look at let's look at each of these cases. So suppose that the type X is the unit type. And now because we're trying to prove an if and only if property, we have to prove two implications. So we're going to say first, we're going to assume that E steps to E prime, and we're going to step assume that E prime is in the set halt one. Okay? And E prime being in the halt uh, set halt one means that e prime eventually reaches some value v. Okay. Now notice that if e steps to e prime and e prime steps to v, then that means that e will eventually reach v because the the steps to star relation is a transitive closure of this st uh, steps to relation. Um, and so that means that since e goes to e prime in one step and e prime goes to 
v in like some n steps, then e will go to v in n plus one steps. And that means that e will eventually reach v. And because e eventually reaches v, that means that e is in the HALT1 set, because that's how we defined HALT1. HALT1 is anything that halts. But we have to go backwards as well. So now, let's assume that e steps to e prime, and that it's not e prime that's in uh, HALT1, but e that's in HALT1. Okay, so now what do we do? Well, we know that because e is in HALT1, e will in some number of steps reach the value v. And we know that e is not a value because we know that e steps to e prime and no, uh, and no value has a, has a reduction. And so that means that because e is not a value, that means that e must step to some e double prime, and that e double prime must go to v in zero or more steps. And because we just proved that the evaluation relation is deterministic, we know that that e double prime and the e prime have to be the same. So we know that on line one that e steps to e prime and on line five we showed that e steps to e double prime and then because evaluation is deterministic we know that e prime and e double prime are the same and because of that we've just learned that e prime eventually reaches v in zero or more steps and that is the very definition of halting so we know that for the halt one predicate that e steps to e prime means that e and e is in halt one if and only if e prime is in halt one. Okay, well that was the that was one of the easy cases. Let's try a harder case. Let's try functions. So suppose that the type x is actually a function type y arrow z. Now that means we want to show that if e steps to e prime and e prime is in the set halt y arrow z, now we want to show that e is in the set halt y arrow z. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, what this means is that e prime is in halt y arrow z, so e prime must evaluate to a value eventually. And also we know that for any term that's in halt y, e prime applied to t is in halt z. And that's just from the definition of the halt y arrow z relation. Or, pre or set. Okay, well we happen to know that e steps to v in some number of steps because e goes to e prime and uh, e prime goes to v. And now let's assume that we have some t in halt y. So what we're trying to prove is that e is in halt y arrow z. And so uh, at the t on line five, we've, we've done the first step. We've proved that E is halting, and now we have to prove that it preserves the property of halting. So, so if we have a T that's in halt Y, what we can do is we can say, we can say, well, we know that uh, E steps to E prime, so therefore E T steps to E prime T. And because E prime is in the set halt y arrow z. Um, it also satisfies this hereditary halting property. So we know that E prime t is in halt z. But that means that E t is in halt z because we know that um, we know that halt z is a set that's closed under uh, under reduction. So since E t goes to E prime t and E prime t is in halt z, that means that E t has to be in the set halt z. And we had that by induction on z. Okay, and so therefore we've established that for every t in halt y, E t is in halt z. And so therefore from uh, line 5 and line 8 we know that E is in halt Y arrow Z. And that was the forward direction of, uh, of closure. Okay, and so now 
Ooh, now we need the backward direction for of closure. So suppose uh, x suppose again what x is y arrow z, and now we want to go backwards. And what that means is we've got e goes to e prime, and we know that e is in the halting set for y arrow z. So those are our two assumptions. And so because e is halting, we know that uh, um, e will eventually reach a value. And we also know that for every t in the set halt y, e applied to t is in the set halt z. And again, this comes from the definition of the halting relation for y arrow z. And so we know that e is not a value because e takes a step to e prime. And so that means we've got an e which steps to e double prime and e double prime that eventually reaches v. And so again, by determinacy, we know that e double prime and e prime are the same. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that t is in the halting set for y. And so that means by congruence, since e steps to e prime, we know that e t steps to e prime t. And because e is in uh, halt y arrow z, we know that e t is in halt z. Okay, so we've got that that far. And because, um, because uh, halt z satisfies the closure relation by uh, the closure property by induction, we know that e prime t is in halt z. And so therefore, we know that for every t in halt y, e prime of t applied to t is in halt z. And so that means that because on line 5, we learned that e prime eventually reaches a value. And on line 9, we know that for every t in halt y, e prime t is in halt z. We know that e prime is in the set halt y arrow z. And so now we've proven that at the function type and at the unit type, the, the membership in the halting set is closed under reduction. And so what that means is we're almost done. There's only one case left, the easy case. So in the case that the uh, type is the empty type, well, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, assume we have e steps to e prime and e prime is in the set halt zero. Well, we defined halt zero to be the empty set. And so what this assumption means is we've just assumed that e prime is in the empty set, which is a contradiction. And so we can, we can just uh, declare a victory here because from contradiction, everything follows. And conversely, we can, if we know that if we assume that e steps to e prime and e is in halt zero, it's still the case that we've assumed something is in the empty set and we still have a contradiction. And so we have now proved that the halt sub x set is always closed under, uh, under evaluation. Okay, so the reason we needed this closure lemma is actually to prove what's called the fundamental lemma. And the fundamental lemma says that if you have a term e of type z with some free variables, x1, uh, big x1 to little xn at type big xn, so we have n free variables of various types and a term e of type z, and if you gave me a list of values of type xi, which are all in the halting set, then the when you substitute all those values in, you get something in the halting set of, of z. And so the re so what this is saying is that ev in some sense, every well-typed term is in the halting set. And so we have to do a little dance in the second premise because we defined our halt predicate only for, for types and we didn't say anything about free variables at all. So what we've got here is we're saying we're lifting it up to free variables by saying that we're going to plug every hole with something in the appropriate halting set. So this v1 
is going to be in the set halt x1, and it's going to fill in for the variable little x1, and so on for each of the uh, each of the variables of of type e. And so if you fill all of them with halting terms, then we want to say that e itself, with the substitution applied, is also in the halting set of of at type z. And the way that we'll prove this is by structural induction on the derivation of e. And so you, we can, we'll go through a few of these cases to see how it works. And so now, suppose that we have a variable, x little xj of type big xj, and that will only happen in this context of x1 to big x, uh, x sub n if x sub j is somewhere in that context. And now the definition of substitution says, well, if you substitute this uh, v1 through vn for x1 through xn into xj, you're going to get out v sub j. And we assumed earlier that each of these uh, v sub j are in the appropriate set halt x sub j. And since v v sub j is in halt x sub j, we know that the substitution applied to x sub j is also in the set halt x sub j. So we've, we've shown that this, uh, ground, uh, this, substitute, this, this uh, expression, well-typed expression, that once you've applied the substitution to it, it's in the halting set. And now that we can we have similar uh, similar lemmas. So like for the unit, what we can do is we can say, well, in any context, the unit value has the unit type, and the definition of substitution says, well, whatever you substitute into the unit value, you get the unit value back because it's got no ver ver it's got no free variables. And the definition of clo transitive closure says, well, the unit value steps to itself in zero steps. And that means that the unit value is in halt 1. And so therefore, the substitution applied to the unit value is also in the set halt 1, because, you know, it's the unit value. Okay, great. What about functions, like lambda abstractions? So our assumption is we have a typing derivation that says lambda y dot e has the type y arrow z under the assumptions that xi, little xi, have the type big xi. Well, when you look at the typing derivation for a lambda abstraction, you get a smaller derivation as a premise. We know now that little xi colon big xi with the context extended by little y at type big y, that that is enough to type e at the type z. Okay, and so that's line two right here. And so now what we can do is we can note that the when you apply this substitution to a lambda expression, it just sort of goes inside of the, uh, it just goes under the binder, because we can always assume that y is different from, from all other variables. And we also know that lambda y anything is a value, and so it's going to step to itself in zero steps. So, so this is a halting expression because it's already a value. And now comes the interesting part. We want to prove that lambda, well-typed lambda terms are hereditarily, are hereditarily halting. And so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we've got some term t in the halting set of y. And so what this means is we know that eventually t is going to evaluate to a value v sub y, and because um, the halting sets are all closed under evaluation, we know that that value v sub y is also in the halting set for y. And so this is where we use the closure lemma. And so now, what we know is that if you apply v sub y to a lambda expression, you get um, v sub i, you, you, you actually do the substitution. So we're going to substitute v sub y for y. And that's going to equal e with v sub i replacing all the x sub i and v sub y replacing the y. And by induction, we know that this, uh, this expression v sub i for x sub i, v sub y for y applied to e is in the halting set for z. 
So remember that all these v-sub-i's were in the various halting sets of the x-sub-i, and we've added a new value v-sub-y um, at, the, at the type of big y, and so that satisfies the, the uh, precondition of the inductive hypothesis. And so this whole term substituted in, this whole substitution substituted into e is in the halting set for z. And what we've also got is by, con uh, by a congruence rule, or by repeated uh, uh, application of the congruence rule, we know that lambda y with you know, this v sub i, x sub i, and e applied to t will eventually reach the same function with v sub y as the argument. And now we can apply to the closure property of z again, and so we know that lambda y with v sub i for x sub i and e applied to t is in the halting set for z. And so we know that this lambda ex expression um, uh, for, for any, for any uh, t and y, this lambda expression with t applied to it is in halt z. And so those were um, almost exactly what we needed to prove the, to prove the uh, property that we need. So we're just going to wrap it up. So we knew that the lambda expression was a value already, so that was number four, and we knew that for any, uh, for any argument t in halt y, when you apply the lambda, apply t to the lambda, you get something in halt z, and so now we know that lambda y with v sub i, x sub i, and e, that's in halt y arrow z. And so that is just what we needed to prove that it was in the, uh, in the halting relation and satisfied the fundamental lemma. Okay, and so now we can go to the uh, application case. And so if you have an application, you have two terms, e and e prime, that produce uh, that have a type z, and e will be something y arrow z, and e prime will be the argument of type y. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just apply induction here. So we're going to say, well, we know that e, when all the variables are filled in with halting things, is in the set halt y arrow z. And so that means that no matter what argument you give it, as long as it's in halt sub y, um, e applied to t with the substitution will be in halt z. But look, by induction we know that v sub i, x sub i, and e prime is in halt y. And that tells us that v sub i, x sub i with e applied to v sub i for x sub i and e prime is in halt z. And just by the definition of substitution, uh, substitutions sort of uh, apply to both components of an application. And so now we've established in 8 that once we've applied the substitution to e and e prime, we get something in halt z, which is just what we wanted. Okay, now what we can do is we can look at the empty type case. So for empty types, we don't have any introductions, but we do have an elimination. So we're going to assume that e has the uh, type 0 with some vari variables, and so what we've got is e is a well-typed term of type 0 with some variables, and if we substitute in uh, values in the halting relation for each of those x sub i, we get something in the set halt 0. And so this is just an application of induction. We know that e has the type 0, so therefore e satisfies the fundamental property, and so if we fill it in with the with the values of the appropriate halting sets, we're going to get something in the set halt 0. But, but halt 0 is the empty set, and so we've achieved a contradiction, and now we have finished the proof of the fundamental lemma. That is really quite exciting, because now we can use the fundamental lemma to do the proof we wanted to in the beginning. We can prove that there are no closed terms of type 0. So if we did have a term of type 0, then the fundamental lemma would tell us that E is in the set halt 0. But halt 0 is the empty set, so that is not possible. And so therefore we know there are no terms of type 
uh, zero that are also closed. And this means that um, this means in addition that every closed term halts because uh, because the fundamental lemma is telling us that if E is a closed term of type X, then E is in the set halt X, and halt, the halting relation is hereditarily terminating. So we've proved everything terminates, and now we know that because everything terminates and reaches a value, and the type 0 has no uh, values of type 0, the type, uh, the type 0 it has no closed terms. And so now we've seen, we've just seen, that logical consistency and termination are very closely linked properties. And so we've sort of extended the Curry-Howard correspondence one more step. We've shown that the simply typed lambda calculus is a total programming language where everything terminates, and that everything terminate is a uh, a the how you take logical consistency and turn it into a computational property. So we showed that every closed program reduces to a value. There are no values of empty type. There are no program, closed programs of empty type. And so now one thing you might wonder a little bit is, OK, well, we gave this programming language with a type system. And then we have just proved that every program written in this type system halts. So have we somehow broken the halting theorem? So if you've taken computation theory, you'll have learned about Turing completeness, and you will have learned Rice's theorem, which says that uh, uh, no interesting property, such as halting, of a program is decidable, and yet we've written a type system that where any every well-typed program halts. What have, what's, what's the gap? And the gap is that the type system does not accept all the terminating programs. We've carved out a subset that we're sure terminate, and there are plenty of terms which do not terminate, and which which uh, there are plenty of terms which absolutely terminate, but which our type system will reject. Okay, and so when you uh, when you go off uh, on your own, it's probably worth trying to extend the logical relation to support products. And a more difficult uh, thing to try is to try extending the uh, logical relation to support some types. So you, you may see some of these things in supervision. Thank you.